Hello, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar series has been convened by AGU H3S, the Hydrology Section Student Subcommittee. This is a five-part series happening every week at this time this summer. And we look forward to having you join us. Previous Navigating Academic Water webinar series hosted by AGU H3S are available on the Quasi YouTube channel. We are very glad to continue and collaborate with AGU H3S on series like this one and are thankful for their hard work in putting together these series for the water science community. My name is Allison Rickard and I am the community outreach intern for Quasi. Quasi is the consortium of universities for the advancement of hydrologic science and our mission is to advance water science by strengthening interdisciplinary collaboration, providing critical infrastructure through, the, through our data services, and promoting education in the water sciences at all levels through programs like this cyber seminar series. I would encourage you to reach out to me, visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, or join our community Slack channel to learn more about what we do and how to get involved. Quasi is celebrating our 20th anniversary this year, and thank you to those of us who joined us earlier this week at the Biennial Colloquium. Um, if you missed out, don't worry, you can view the recordings of many of the biennial sessions on the Quasi YouTube channel. I'll add information for all of these things in the chat in a moment. But before we get started, a few logistical things. Firstly, this webinar series is being recorded and will be posted on the Quasi YouTube channel later this afternoon. Second, later on, <clears throat> later on in this session, we will be breaking out into breakout rooms. And these breakout rooms will not be recorded. And I will post the link to these breakout rooms towards the end of the session. Um, the breakout rooms will start one hour from now and the link will be posted both in the chat and in should be in your email where you got the link to this session. Um, finally, please use the Q and A functionality to submit questions to our panelists. Thank you again for joining us at AGU H3S for putting together a fantastic cyber seminar series. Without further ado, I'd like to pass things off to AGU H3S member Julianne Davis to introduce the session and panelists. Thank you, Allison. Um, as she said, I'm a member of the AGU Hydrology Section Student Subcommittee, and I'm also a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill. Today's topic is job interviews. We're gonna talk about phone interviews, a little bit about Zoom interviews and in-person interviews, just to get the lowdown on what those are really like. After the opening remarks and panelist introductions today, we'll then start a Q&A. H3S has prepared questions, but we want this to be a community event. So we encourage you to type your questions for the panelists into the Q&A so that we can ask the panelists the questions during this portion of the webinar or during the breakout rooms. And panelists can also answer your questions back in the Q&A. After the first hour, so at one o'clock Eastern, we'll have a quick break. This meeting will end, and then you'll go to the next meeting. The link will be in the chat and in your email, as Allison said, where we'll do two rounds of breakout rooms. There'll be four breakout rooms, one with each panelist, so you'll get a chance to talk to them in a bit more depth and really hear what their experiences have been like and get some expert intel from these people. And then we'll finish up at the end of two hours at 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next session as well. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves today. Um, I will start with Krista, and then if you want to pass it to someone else, Krista, that would be great. All right. Hi, folks. My name is Krista Kelleher. I'm an assistant professor at Syracuse University. I'm jointly hired between the Departments of Earth and Environmental Sciences and Civil Engineering. Um, I've done a lot of interviews in my time, and I'm very excited to, to share my experiences with you. Um, and my research sort of spans uh, lots of human impacted systems, uh, looking at how water uh, moves and how that impacts water quality. And I am going to pass it to Diego. 
Thank you, Krista. Hi, everyone. My name is Diego Rivero Sidegui. I am an associate professor in the Department of Geography at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I am an ecohydrologist. I have been a member of AGU for 19 years. I was looking into this this morning. Uh, AGU has been a really great community. Um, it's given me uh, a lot uh, professionally and, and really personally. Um, and I am excited to be here and to um, tell you a little bit about uh, my experiences. Oh, and I'm going to pass it to uh, Melissa. Hi, uh, my name is Melissa Diaz. I'm currently a postdoc scholar at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, I finished my PhD at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center at The Ohio State University last summer. Um, actually, really recently, I'm like a week <laughs> past my defense anniversary, which is pretty exciting. Um, I'm really new to the job market. This was my first year. Um, I had interviews this year, so I can answer some questions about how that was during COVID times. Um, in terms of my research, my dissertation was focused on understanding soil geochemistry in Antarctica. For my postdoc, I've moved now to the Arctic, and I'm looking at how meltwater events affect redistribution of nutrients. And then also I have some work on sea ice looking at uh, the geochemistry of brines. Diane, I think it's you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, Melissa. I'm Diana Carwin. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm a hydrologist and a catchment scientist, so I think about watersheds as a unit of study. Um, and I am certainly a field and lab scientist. I use a lot of chemistry in river water to tell me about watershed processing. Um, so I, Diego, I applaud you. I haven't counted how many years I've been an AGU member for because I think I might be a little aghast, but um, I appreciate AGU and also Quasi. I'm currently the um, committee chair for the Standing Committee on Hydrologic Instrumentation for Quasi um, and sort of work a lot with instrumentation and chemistry to make observations. Um, I will admit I did one, uh, one season of academic interviews, but since starting my position here at Minnesota in 2013, I've probably been on half a dozen hiring committees. So I'm excited to share a perspective from sort of both sides of um, that table and that Zoom interview experience. Thank you, Phyllis. We're gonna jump right in with questions. Um, we'll start with kind of what happens first during the interview process, which would be a phone interview. And then I'm going to kind of ask you first for experiences related to phone interviews and then Zoom interviews, because I think they probably differ in some ways. So what can we expect for a phone interview and how should we prepare? Okay, I'm unmuting. I'm going first. Um, one, I think the, the, the place to start is by looking up and, and starting to investigate what are common questions. So there's all sorts of lists online. You can talk to other people who have been recently on the job market. A lot of jobs are starting to share what questions they ask during phone or Skype interviews. That's, that's sort of becoming more and more common. And you can always ask if, if, they would be willing to share the list of questions that they're going to ask um, with you. But really that's that's sort of the first step is, is finding questions. And then I actually like write out my responses to them. I used to do everything off the cuff. I'm realizing that doesn't work very well for me. Maybe you all are better like, like see to your pants uh, ready to go. But I, I write out questions and then um, for phone interviews, they, they can't see you. So um, having those things printed out is actually uh, something that I have done. I'll follow up um, what Krista said. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that in general, by the time you make it to an interview, they already know um, your, your CV. They, they've seen your publications. They probably read your publications. They know um, uh, 
uh, what grant experience you had and all sort of like the, the hard metrics they know. So by the time you make it to a phone interview or to a campus interview, it applies to both. Um, they really want to know who you are. Uh, they want to know how mature, how ready you are for a position. Are you are you still like with the with the student mentality that we call in uh, um, in committees? Uh, is, are you acting as a as a colleague or as a student? Do you generate ideas? Do you have lots of ideas? And there are usually I, I think of like five or six topics that people will want to know about. First, they want to know why you're interested in this institution. Uh, they want to know about your past research and your future research, what research plans you have. And that involves a number of things, right? So from really ideas to like funding and whatnot. Um, they want to know about your, maybe your, your past teaching experience and your teaching interests within the context of what that institution um, offers. Um, they probably want to know something about what you would require in terms of uh, like maybe labs, are you a field scientist, are you a computer modeler, um, those kind of things. And um, more recently, um, of course, they want to know um, what you think and what sort of like your, your goals and are for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, you want to show that you've thought about all those topics, you, you want to um, uh, research all those topics you want to research the institution and let them know that you're that you're ready that you're ready to be their colleague yeah i i want to add to what krista and diego have said i think the important thing to think about is there the interview especially that first conversation whether it's phone zoom or in person is kind of assessing where you're going to be and where you plan to go in the next five years. So like Diego said, they've read your CV, they've read your application packet, which is probably longer than maybe you thought it would be when you started on the academic job market. And they want to think about where do you plan to be? What are those ideas you have for your next proposal? Who might you collaborate with in that department at that institution for those next steps um, research wise in your career? Um, and also thinking about your experiences, this is rel uh, very relevant for diversity and inclusion now, and also just your communication and your history of working with groups where um, maybe the people or members of that group are different from you, and how you approached that, how you navigated that, how you responded to that, that's something that I see increasingly important and also sort of not well parameterized on a typical CV. And so you may have had to write a diversity and inclusion statement or, or answer something like that in your packet. Um, I guess one other thing that I, this is one of those things I didn't realize when I was an interviewee until I was on the other side of it. Often for those first phone or Zoom conversations for a remote interview, the questions are standard. And so everyone that's maybe five or three or seven people that they're doing these remote interviews with, they will all be asked the same questions. And so if there's something that you may think of like, this was really well covered in my CV, didn't you read my CV? Yes, they did, but they have to ask the same questions to all of their candidates in order to make decisions you know, on their end before they decide who to bring to campus. So it may be important to kind of think about that too. I wanted to just emphasize something that Krista said, and it's to ask questions because the structure of the phone interviews are usually different at the institutions. So I had full disclosure at six this year and each of them was different. And some of them were half an hour long, 20 minutes, um, sometimes they said you will have five questions and four minutes to answer each question and this number of minutes for any of your own questions. And other times they said that there weren't going to be any time for questions. So that actually is really important because that opportunity for you to ask questions, if you do it the right way, can also be a way to weave in some information about yourself because these interviews are so short and you're trying to convince them that you're the best person for this job. So really knowing the structure of this interview is, is I think in a lot of ways, the most important part. 
is figuring out, you know, how much time you have. Because the other thing is if they tell you you have five minutes for each question, and like Diana said, if the, they say they're not going to take any questions from you, even if you finish early, it's the same across the board. You can't ask questions afterwards. So if you take 30 seconds to answer their question and they expected you to take five minutes, you know, you should maybe take some time and write down an answer and practice it or talk to another person just to make sure that you're meeting the expectations of the committee. And just to sort of close that out, there was a quick question in the chat that I want to address that I think like we we just don't realize the way that information is shared. Like I didn't understand this stuff as a student. You this first interview that you have it could be via phone, it could be via Zoom. They might call it a phone interview and it's via Zoom. It could be in person. Mine, some of mine were at AGU. So they come in all shapes and sizes. And usually they're very specific about this in the email when they're asking you to interview. And if they're not specific about it, it's okay to get back to them and ask them, what will be the format? How long will this, like, how long will this appointment be? Um, will I be able to see everyone on the line? Because sometimes like if there's one person in their interview pool that isn't gonna have video conference access, you know, then they don't give anyone video conference access. And it's meant to make it sort of even between all the applicants. Um, I feel like that's something that's actually gotten a little bit better and more accessible with the pandemic and, and Zoom. Um, but yeah, it's okay to ask. Those are all amazing. And Melissa, you inspired another question that you kind of been thinking about. Because, you know, she said sometimes you do get the opportunity to ask questions, sometimes you don't. But when you do have a chance to ask questions, what are good questions to ask at the end of this first interview? And anyone can answer this. It was just inspired by Melissa. Yeah, I'll comment um, and I'll, I'll just be brief to leave time for other people. Um, but that's, it's kind of a funny question because it's, it's hard. Um, I ended up with like this huge list of questions. And the thing is, some of these questions you feel like might be more suitable if you get a full interview, but don't plan on that. So you might still ask questions like the one that I love answer or asking to every department is what's your, what's your five-year vision? Because they ask the same thing of you. They ask you, what's your five to 10-year plan? And I think it's really interesting to know what their five to 10-year plan is. Are they looking to hire people in a specific area? Are they looking to expand a different area of research? Or do they want more expertise in teaching in this spot? Um, I thought that that, like, as like the one question that I asked that I found was the most helpful was asking them the same thing back. What's your vision for the next five years? I think that, sorry, go ahead, Diana. No, I was just gonna say, that's also the kind of question that sometimes, but not often, you can like glean from the department website, right? So it's important to do your homework and look at the readily accessible online information about the department and then think about like your questions for stepping into that, you know? I noticed I would be the only one in this research area or, you know, I, I noticed like maybe it looks like you're redoing an undergrad program or a grad program or adding a new field station, that kind of thing. And so I would encourage you to think too about what you see from like the outward facing side of the department and how you might interact with that. Cause you're, you're kind of sussing them out too. My short and sweet one is, is like, what is, what is your favorite part of, of your job or your favorite part of your department? And if you're short on time, people just give you little snippets and then they feel really good about themselves too. Letting them talk makes them feel good. So yeah, give, giving them a chance to, to talk about something positive that they see, I find is usually a, 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 a strategy. <laughs> and I'll add that I, um, I always like to ask about um, opportunities for uh, recruiting new students, especially when you were starting. Um, if there are uh, fellowships, if, if there are um, 
uh, yeah, programs at the institution that would allow you to recruit uh, either graduate students or, or undergraduate students that would um, help you get started with your research um, as soon as you start your job. Those are great. Now, I know some of you have been on both sides of this part of the process. So either from your experience, or you don't have to share a personal experience if you don't want to, or from being an interviewer, what questions do candidates not answer well at this stage? Are there particular difficult questions or just ones that tend to trip people up? Maybe I'll, I'll start with this. Um, I think that one question that, um, I, I, I guess I, can, I can't think necessarily of the question, but the topic is what would you do beyond what you already did for your PhD, right? You, 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 you do a PhD and you spend four or five years studying like this specific thing. Um, you know, you did a good job and that's why you're getting an interview. But they want to know that you're capable of like zooming out and, and, and taking the ideas and the approaches that you learn and applying them to something else to um, another problem and that's and that's difficult i mean that is difficult to do um so they want to assess that they want to um they want to learn a little bit about your vision as a as an independent researcher so um spending some time thinking about that and, and thinking about how you would move beyond what you just did for your phd you're not just going to do phd point you know, 2.0 for, for uh, your tenure track position. Um, but it's spending some time in, in telling them that you really thought about this um, carefully uh, would go a long ways. I guess I would add another kind of layer to that in terms of you could be interviewing at very different types of institutions, right? So if you're interviewing at a small private college, a uh, uh, um, primarily undergraduate institution, sort of an R1, a land grant, um, and some of those, particularly I've seen this in the land grant institutions, that's thinking about how where you wanna go kind of fits in with their program. So it's not just articulating where you wanna go, but thinking about how that fits in the context of their state, their geography, um, that can be particularly important because your institution may be in a completely different part of the world or um, set, geographic setting than where you did your PhD research. And for some, some institutions and some departments, they want to know how your future fits them. Sorry, it's a quick one. Sorry, Krista. Um, you know, as somebody who just did this, you know, the last six months or so, I, I guess it's been that long. Um, one thing that I'd say is a, a mistake that I made, and I'd say that some of my peers made, was feeling comfortable asking for clarification if you didn't understand a question. Because some of them are really broad and sometimes intentionally so. And I think it was my second phone interview. I got this really broad question and I started answering it. And I realized halfway through that they might have actually been asking me a different question. And I was confused and I should have just asked from the onset. So I think, you know, when you're answering these questions, it's okay to, to ask for clarification um, so that you know that you're, you're giving the response that they want. Melissa, that's perfect. That was more or less exactly what I was going to say. I'm going to build exactly on that. The question that I found the hardest and that when I interviewed other people, I felt like they struggled the most with too, is there's always some sort of flavor of question that's like, what's like the hot topic in your field and how is your research going to, going to contribute to that? And like I've gotten myself in positions where I'm going on and on about critical zone science. And then I'm like, well, I'm not really a critical zone researcher. <laughs> 
so so it like sort of thinking in advance what what is the way that you can answer that question that type of flavor of question that really broad big question but that lets you talk about yourself i think is is really challenging personally i'm i'm much better with specifics like I'm very good with like, I'm gonna need this and this is the size of group I wanna build and these are the places we'll work. But those big broad questions for me were always the most challenging. So sort of knowing in advance that they're coming and having a plan for how you can talk about how your science is super cool and will address those big questions um, is something to be prepared for. I know some of you mentioned preparing for phone interviews by writing down answers to questions. And now I'm going to go and write all of these potential trick points in my own list for when I get to the stage of this. So thank you. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one in the Zoom room that is going to be coming back to this. Now we're going to switch to talking about what happens in an in-person or if we're in you know, the COVID world, what the longer multiple day perhaps interview looks like. In a pre-COVID world, what is that interview structure? Can one of you kind of walk us through what the interview might look like? How many days is it? How long is it? Like how many hours are you on point? All that stuff. Uh, maybe I'll start again. Um, I mean, one thing with interviews is that you're on all the time, right? You cannot let your guard down. So that is probably like the most draining aspect of it. Um, you will meet with faculty, you will meet with students, you will meet with um, a, a dean or an associate dean or um, someone in the administration. Um, everyone is really interested about uh, you. Everyone is interested about filling this position and, and sort of like uh, fulfilling the needs of the department. Um, but it's, I feel again, going back to to what I said earlier, they know sort of like the details of you, your work. They, they just want to see who you are. And I feel like perception is um, everything at, at an interview and people are going to judge you based on how they perceive you. Um, one thing that is uh, important to, at least for me, it was to sort of like, um, uh, let go of some of that pressure of the two days is to think that um, or think of the folks that are at that institution that may know of your work. Um, so go back to perhaps you had a really good interaction at an AGU poster with one of them. And you really got to talk about the uh, nuts and bolts of your research with one person those those conversations are highly valuable, even though I, at the time you didn't even know that that was going to happen. Um, or maybe that person talked to someone else and, and, and those those kind of things are, are huge for interviews. So I, I feel like uh, it's important to step back and to look at sort of like the big picture and to to uh, not think so much about like this two days, uh, but more like you as a researcher and, and, and things that you know you've done well. Um, and if you're in a position where, where someone at that institution is advocating for you because they already know your work from this prior experience, you're in a really good position. So, um, and you know, and you go and you would probably see that familiar face or familiar faces and I think, um, um, all of us here can probably talk about uh, those experiences. So those are going to be folks that are going to be um, rooting for you. But yeah, it's um, it's on all the time. You're talking to very smart people all the time. Uh, not everyone is going to be an expert in your in your field. Everyone is going to be um, very curious, uh, probably very skeptic. But everyone will value creativity, and that's sort of like something that you have to play to your advantage. I can speak to some more specifics building on that um, with the way that we've sort of organized our interviews. And remember, like every institution is going to be different. You usually start with somebody who's in charge, department chair, like sort of first out of the gate in the morning. Uh, interviews last a, a day and a half to two days, sometimes a day only if they're very short, but you're usually sort of meeting with somebody who's going to be shepherding you through the process first. 
Um, you'll meet with faculty members. Uh, the graduate student meeting I had with Syracuse students was probably my most intense consultation ever. There were 20 of them and they all had questions, but it really said to me that they cared and they, they wanted to know who was going to be in this position. Um, you uh, will meet with, um, you'll often meet with a dean. Um, so being able to talk really generally about your science and, and in a way that that um, somebody really far outside your field will understand um, is usually important. And then uh, as De Diego and others have alluded, like these, this mix up is, is going to be different, whether you're interviewing at sort of a small liberal arts college or a larger university. But those are a lot of the faces and people that you will meet with. And of course, meeting with the faculty um, happens sort of throughout that day, whether it's 30 minute meetings, hour meetings, sometimes they're group meetings, sometimes they're individual, uh, it's all over the place. I was gonna say, even your meals will be turned into meetings, right? So that, and these are opportunities. Um, you're on all the time and this, this sort of includes breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and so sometimes those meals are maybe feel less formal and you may be with say a group of graduate students over you know brown bag lunch or you'd be with other faculty members in the department over dinner but those those are part of the part of the package of your interview um so yeah just to echo that that you're on all the time melissa I would love to hear, not to tell you what you thought, but what it was like doing these really long, like multi-day perhaps interviews over Zoom, because I think some of us that are probably on the job market right now are going to be in that situation or have been in that situation. I would love to hear from someone else that has been there. Yeah, honestly, I, as like a, a comment on <laughs> uh, academic hiring in general, I wouldn't be surprised if there are a little bit more Zoom interviews um, moving forward. So I haven't done an on-campus in-person interview, um, which I, I think is really important just as an aside because you get to see the institution, you get to check out the area, meet with people in person. Um, but I, I will also say that the places that made me offers this year all flew me out there um, when, the vaccine situation got a little bit better for me to like see and meet with people in person after the whole process was done. Um, most of my interviews were two days long. Um, the ones that were on the East Coast were great because they didn't start sooner than like 9 a.m. Um, the ones on the West Coast obviously started later, but that was really tough because then I was going into 8 p.m. sometimes, um, which was really tough to not eat because you're, again, eating meals with some of the faculty is an important part of the interview process. But when you're doing it through Zoom, you get some breaks, but then it's just you kind of sitting in your office, like quickly eating your lunch for the half hour that they gave you or like running to the bathroom. So in a way it made it a little, I shouldn't say physically easier, it's just different. You know, there is, if you've ever given a seminar talk and you've met with faculty in the department, you go on walks for some of your meetings. And when we had people at Ohio State that interviewed, they might like go for a walk around the Oval. With Zoom, it's a lot of really just sitting here and I found myself getting really restless. The nice thing too is, you know, I can play with things below the screen to like keep myself still a little bit entertained. Um, and yeah, the day ends sooner because you're not eating dinner usually with everyone. I think one place did a happy hour of sorts um, where they said, well, why don't we meet sort of informally at the end of the interview and, you know, people can have a beer over Zoom and that was nice. Um, and also less intimidating because in Zoom, only one person can talk at a time. So there was less pressure to have all of these side conversations going. Um, and uh, I guess word of advice, make sure that your internet is, is really, really working well. Um, twice during my job talks, uh, my internet cut out for about 15 minutes. And while everyone was really understanding, 
it's hard not to get frazzled and like rattled in that kind of situation. So um, yeah, the Zoom interview process kind of sucks, but it's not the worst. Um, I think that most institutions were really good about giving breaks. Um, and then one, one institution even said, we can split this into four half days and split that up across an entire week if you want. And that was really helpful for those who, you know, still need to work or need to take care of family members and such. That's all really incredible insight. And I think there are probably pros and cons to both types of interviews. And I think your point that like, there probably will be more Zoom interviews going forward just because it is, you know, lower travel requirement and just public health can demand it too. It's gonna to be, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but I appreciate both perspectives here. Then for the next question, we're also kind of wondering about how you learn department culture from an interview. What kinds of questions can you ask to find out if it will be a supportive environment for new faculty or to learn what the department culture is like? Notice there's like a lot of hesitation from all the panelists before jumping into that one. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is one that I think is particularly takes more thought thinking about Zoom versus in person. Um, and some of it too goes back to you knowing yourself and thinking about how you interact with people and how you get feedback from people. And so I'm grateful that I had some in-person interviews where I was able to get those sort of one-on-one um, -on -one conversations while walking from one place to another, or when someone who's now a dear colleague was driving me to my interview dinner for that night um, to kind of suss that out. Um, and so this is something, yeah, this is tricky for me. Um, and I guess I'll, I mean, I'll put it out there. I'm, I'm a woman. I had my first child during my PhD. So I had a toddler who was at home with my mother-in-law while I was off on interviews. And so um, ideas, you know, were in my mind, but I didn't feel free to talk about them quite so much and so openly, given that they're not supposed to ask me, you know, what my life situation is. Um, and so I was really grateful that this colleague I mentioned before um, just volunteered information kind of openly to me about the culture of the department and people having children and families being valued and the fact that the building was less empty after 5 p.m. Um, and so when you're in that in-person interview or if you have like one-on-one -on -one sessions, sometimes it's... Um, listening for those types of of comments that are coming from the people that you're um that you're interviewing with and like that's something i took forward especially when serving on panels on the other side making sure to sort of have that information that's just more available to them but not answering like not directly asking them questions but just like yep i'm driving you to dinner and there's two car seats and a bunch of soccer balls in the back of my car <laughs> um so that that can maybe open the door to conversation. Yeah, I want to follow up on what Diana said um, during my interview here. Actually, one um, faculty member just said we have a, a great uh, policy leave for uh, new parents uh, for both mothers and fathers. And uh, so I just use that to start asking questions right away because uh, they opened the door to that. So um, I did. And he, and he, he mentioned, uh, I was like, yeah, and it's a policy that we all want our new faculty to use because we don't want that policy to go away. And um, so listening for those uh, opportunities where people would uh, perhaps open the door to, to something and just following up on that is, uh, is always a good way. It's a little tough on, on Zoom to get a good idea of personality. Um, and it was kind of funny because I, you know, I, I had offers at a few places this year. So when I went out to visit and saw them in person, 
And like one person who I had gotten friendly with through our Zoom meetings was like, oh, you're much shorter than I thought you were. And I was like, yeah, I know. And it was funny though, because she was actually much taller than I thought she was. So like meeting people in person was actually kind of funny because we, we, I guess we all had these ideas of what everyone looked like. Um, even through Zoom, you don't really know. Um, I'd say that the, you know, when you're going for a walk or you're sitting in somebody's office, maybe in person, um, sometimes you might have sort of those awkward moments where nobody's speaking for a second. And like, especially if you're on a walk, like it's probably fine. On Zoom, there's that pressure to have a conversation that lasts the entire half hour or hour that you're meeting with somebody. And academia, or at least the, the interview process, totally favors extroverted people. And for those of you who are not extroverted um, or who get tired speaking to random people for so many hours a day, um, I don't have a lot of advice on that other than you know, pull on, pull on some of those experience you, experiences you've had in the past. Like I worked uh, as a bartender and a grocery store clerk. And I was like, I can have the same conversation 15 times because I'm trained to do that, even if I'm not, you know, that outgoing necessarily in person. Um, and it was fine because again, you, you're not actually expected to be that social <laughs> in your job, but in the interview, you are expected to, to see if you can get along with people. The types of questions that they ask are pretty telling um, and how will people respond to your answers. Like somebody asked me, well, who specifically in the department would you like to collaborate with? And I don't really like giving specifics to that answer because I think that it's really limiting. You can do all the research you want on the department website and checking out CVs and recent publications, but somebody might have an interest in your area that's not really written out explicitly online. So by saying specific individuals, you might be excluding someone who you might actually be really excited to work with. So I actually say, I'm really excited to work with folks in the department who have these specific interests. So instead of saying this individual, I say, faculty that are interested in studying dust in urban environments, knowing exactly which faculty they might be. And usually they'll step forward and say that themselves. But this one faculty member really pushed me and even said, why is it because you didn't do your homework? And I was like, wow, that's really rude. And like that's, that's one of those moments where it doesn't take a lot of insight to realize that I don't think we get along personality wise because that's that's not something you say to someone um so you know I'd say that in general though most people I met were really nice um but also acknowledging that everyone has a different personality and that like you might be feeling a little awkward and chances are they are too I think all of these comments are spot on. Um, what what really helped me was was talking to um, the other assistant professors in particular. Like, what what has been your experience? What are things that you you have like you've really enjoyed about the institution? Are there any things that like you wish you had or you wish you would have known before you joined? Like, you're gonna get a sense for who, as others have said, like who every interview I've been on, there's been like one or two people that you that you form some sort of connection with or that that leave the door open sort of as Diego was describing. Um, and, and really like reaching out to those people to make sure that um, they are having a positive experience. For me, that was, that was my way to make sure that the department was the right fit for me. Yeah, Kristen mentioned this earlier, but you know, writing, things down is really great. You know, I was apprehensive the first time, but I have, I had a notebook and each meeting that I had with each person, I had a list of questions, two of them on their research, and then a list of like department specific questions, and then some like personal questions. And like you were mentioning, Kristen, my favorite one to ask, you know, some faculty was, uh, what, what advice would you give somebody that's in my position right now? Um, and it was actually really great to, to hear the answers that I got across the board. Um, so being prepared is, and having, you know, some of those um, social questions is really helpful too. 
But, and one more thing, like even whether it's a phone, a Zoom or an on, in person, they should give you your schedule ahead of time. So if you're not getting that ahead of time to do your homework, it's okay to reach out to the committee chair or the admin or whoever and just say, you know, I was wondering, I, would, I hadn't seen a copy of my schedule yet. Could I please get the copy of the schedule ahead of time? And so many, um, Krista, thanks for answering most of these questions that have been popping up in the Q&A. <laughs> Um, but I saw there's one there that um, I think everyone else addressed briefly about, you know, sort of the illegal questions asking about your marital status, your family status, disability status. Um, and I'll say that I didn't experience that this year in the interviews that I had, um, but I went to a workshop that was specifically geared for women in male dominated fields. And we talked a lot about this. And what I learned is sometimes they're not asking you these illegal questions because they are trying to uh, put you in a bad spot. Sometimes they're really excited, like Diego was mentioning, to say, we have great parental leave, like, and they're looking for an opportunity to brag about how awesome that is. Um, it, they're still not allowed to ask that. Following up, though, on that, the question that was asked in the chat um, about whether you should disclose if you have a partner or not. I honestly think that that's up to you. Um, I heard from one department chair that I know that said, it's really helpful. And this is what he tells applicants. He's like, I'm not going to ask you, but it's really helpful if you need spousal accommodations that you let me know as soon as possible, because sometimes they take a really long time. So like I have a partner, he's not an academic. And sometimes I mentioned it, particularly in regions where I was worried about whether he would have a job or not. And, uh, it didn't, I don't think, affect uh, how my the rest of my interview progressed. Thank you all for touching on, you know, finding those people in the department that kind of give you that opportunity to ask some of these maybe more personal questions and like what to do if there is something personal that you want to know. I think that's really important. And I think that there's probably a lot of great potential for conversations on that in breakout rooms this afternoon too. We're going to switch and now think about job talks a little bit. Um, this is kind of like the time to shine or so I've heard. I've never done an interview. Still a few years from this. But how specific should we make our job talks? How do we balance general introduction with specific research projects and our future plans? How long do you have? <laughs> no, this is, I, I was terrified of this the first time I did it. And then it just becomes more and more fun because you're just talking about all your ideas and you're talking about your plans. Um, I'll, I'll like add a couple things and then, and then kick it to the others. But um, I like to sort of start by talking about the position title and what they're looking for and how I fit that. Um, so really like, making some sort of Venn diagram or some sort of um, some sort of visual representation of, of my interests and then talking about the types of people I work with, um, the types of researchers, my collaborators, um, because right, the takeaway here is they're not just getting you, they're getting all the people you know and interact with. And, and that's like a way to sell yourself, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, talking about your, your sort of current research is usually the thing that I spend the most time talking about. I try to have sort of two or three like vignettes. Um, I've also seen people be really successful just sort of focusing on one major topic and doing a deep dive. Um, I call my style the charcuterie board approach if you if you would like to adopt it. I like having like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, and then making sure that you end sort of talking about where are places you're gonna go for funding and how, how you really see yourself fitting into the department um, has, has been sort of my approach to this. Yeah, maybe I'll follow up on, on what Krista said. Um, so giving them a little bit about your, your vision, your research approach, who you are as a researcher, um, and showing, I like showing sort of like uh, different projects as, as case studies that fall under this umbrella. Um, I, 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 I like that. Uh, one thing I was going to say about the job talk is um, a lot of the folks that 
are, or I don't know if a lot, but a number of people that um, you're probably never going to meet during the interview, but who are going to vote, um, will only see your job talk, right? And maybe they go to the job talk or maybe they, they'll just watch a recording. So the job talk is, is really important. Uh, um, you wanna practice it lots of times. It's not, a, it's not your PhD defense talk, it's different. Um, and you want, to, you want to come across as, as a colleague, as a big thinker, as a generator of, uh, of you know, new projects, someone who's gonna raise the profile of their department for that position they're looking for. So, and many people will only see uh, that of you. I totally took the case study or um, charcuterie board approach too. Um, and I, I think it's important to realize that, you know, most things in academia aren't necessarily descriptive writing or descriptive uh, activities, but they're persuasive. You're making this presentation because you are trying to show that you are the best person for this job. And the way that I did it is I have these different field areas. I do urban geochemistry. I do this polar work. And, you know, I'm doing some work on ocean worlds. So I said, you know, this is the general umbrella of my research. And after each of my little case studies or vignettes, I actually had a slide that said, this is the next proposal that I'm currently writing or that I have like in preparation on this topic of urban geochemistry or polar research. So I talked about the proposal, where would we be submitting, generally what, like, because you don't want to give too much information because um, you don't know who's on the call, um, but just a, like a really brief overview. And then one of the mistakes I think that some of us make who are pursuing or academic positions at R1s, teaching is still part of your job. And on each of that slide that I put on my like future work area, I had like, I think that this work could be integrated into this class. And then I had something on, you know, there are department interests, or I know that folks are interested in pursuing research in this area. So I had that after each of my little vignettes. And then at the end, I had sort of the summary slide of this is what I'm going to be doing for near term, which I defined as the first one to three years, and then further out, which was five plus. Um, so again, I, I took it more as I'm trying to convince you that I am the best person for this job. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And I did take a similar approach and advice that I got, um, going into this process from my dissertation advisor was you want to make sure in those vignettes that you're showcasing not only work that's kind of like your current, that's maybe what you're presenting at conferences and writing up, but also show ones where you've completed the art from question to publication, right? So during those vignettes, um, make sure you're presenting it that way, make sure you're citing yourself on the slide kind of in the bottom corner um, to show what you've taken. Um, and I guess one other thing that I um, I know I did at, at each of my in-person interviews, but was to place what I had done or the toolkit that I, I use into the context of that institution. So when I interviewed here at Minnesota, there were um, some items that were not just like kind of I knew in the buzz at the university, but were also hitting like a PBS documentary and the local um, more sciencey environmental bend news in the state. And like, I actually opened with that and was like, here's how my work fits into this. And so it's like both showcasing the toolkit that I applied in a really different setting, but being like, and I think this has promise here and here's like the next step to go about it. And at an R1, I had both a job to, uh, research talk and a teaching talk. So I had to pretend to teach, like I was given parameters for a mock class. They're like, here's a class. And they didn't tell me that that class would end up in my load. I found out that on the in-person interview. Um, but they're like, if you had to teach something in this class, can you like put together a fake, you know, 
a mock lecture. Um, and so that was like, and that was viewed kind of as many times and equally as my research talk. So te teaching is important, um, even if it's not, even if it's 50% of your appointment load. Thank you for everyone giving those great examples of how to find this balance. And especially for mentioning that like teaching is part of an academic job too. You know, unfortunately, you know, we had some questions prepared about what to do in a teaching demo and ran out of time, but that was would be great breakout room questions. And in the last few minutes, we'll do, I guess, a more rapid fire, but then now say we're post interview. We skipped a lot of things that'll happen during the interview, I know. But after the interview, how are we supposed to follow up? Who should we reach out to and when should we do it? Or should we do it at all? I would send thank you notes starting with the chair. Um, so certainly thanking the chair of the search committee and it'll be obvious to you after an interview who that is. Um, and I've seen it done well where people send individual thank you notes um, to individual faculty, et cetera, that they've met with. But starting um, with the search committee chair and the department chair, just a quick thank you email, like is the next day or as soon as you get back home would be my rapid answer. Same as uh, thank you notes to those that um, you spend a lot of time with. And then after that, kind of like forget about it. And I know it's hard and it's 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 horrible, but forget about it. Don't ask. That's my approach. Um, I actually asked at the end of all my interviews, because most of them had like an exit interview with either the chair, the search chair, or the committee. And I just asked, when should I expect to hear back? And everywhere actually gave me a pretty good answer. They said, our next faculty meeting is on this date, so we'll hopefully have a ranking, you know, sometime around then. Um, I also sent, I didn't send individual emails, I sent one to the search committee um, after each, each interview. And uh, I used online resources. If there's like an Eco Evo job board, um, it's an open Google Sheets. I also used the Earth and Environmental Science job board and people post, they're like, oh, I got a phone interview today or, oh, I got a rejection notice. And that was the best thing for my mental sanity because I didn't hear back from everywhere and you probably won't. But then when you see somebody say like, oh, I, you know, someone was made an offer, it's a lot easier to let that go. I, yeah, Melissa, I'm, I'm with you that the, the mental, like disentangling yourself from the emotional, like interviews are so emotional. I don't know. I think I shared this on our other AGU one. Like I would just sit in the airport and cry. Like I, it's like, I was like a crazy person because it's, it's like, you're really like bearing your soul and putting yourself out there and, and just sort of like, you know, generally wanting wanting this group of people to pick you and and pick you as their new colleague. So um, just the the level of energy required, like be ready for the emotional aftermath. Um, I send a lot of thank you notes. That's my style. You know, find yours. I think the folks on this call have identified some people that are really important to send those notes to. Um, there is probably somebody who's making your schedule and booking all your travel, doing those things. Um, make sure that a thank you note goes to that person too. Um, everybody talks like uh, that was that was something that was important for me, and it's and it seems silly, but that was something I always wanted to know when we were interviewing candidates. Like, did they reach out to the the person who who was behind the scenes and really doing the work to set up the schedule? Um, it, right, it's not a decision that I use to say if I'm voting for somebody or not, but it's all sort of a piece of a bigger puzzle. Um, and I think thank you notes never hurt. They never hurt at all. Speaking of thank yous, thank you all panelists and thank you everyone that put questions into the Q&A. We're now going to transition to the next phase of this. So there'll be a link to another Zoom room in the chat. 
you head there for breakout rooms and bring your unanswered questions. You get another hour with these panelists and I'm sure they have more to share. So with that, thank you all very much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you at 105 Eastern in the other Zoom link. Bye. And thank you, Julianne. See you all in the link in a couple of minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone.